Uh, you keep mentioning that a lot of people are calling you an accommodationist. Um, I think you're more of uh, a diplomat. It's more diplomacy oh, versus accommodationism, which aren't exactly synonymous. So do you think you should be trying to push for this term being applied to you instead of accommodationism? That's probably a fair point. In fact, I probably go on about being an accommodationist more than I need to because I don't think... I think one person is referred to me as an accommodationist, and, and that's it. So maybe I, I'm overly being overly defensive about that. And it's true. I think you know that there does seem to be more of an appetite now, even among people who are big fans of the work of people like Richard Dawkins, to say, okay, well, maybe now is the time we can just ease off, and you know we don't we don't you know the space is there now. And there's a wide spectrum of people who can say they are atheists and not feel that somehow they're going to be viewed as extremists. So yeah, I'm, I'm a diplomat. Thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll use that. Um, so there was someone who was... Well, what would, yes. We might as well swap over sides so that we can efficiently uh, make use of the microphone. And then your microphone goes, off, goes to the gentleman there with the striped t-shirt. Hello. So you talked just at the end of your speech about perhaps the need to back off on the Richard Dawkins style of very aggressive atheism because we're winning. But do you not think potentially that um, quite a number of victories even now are due to the fact that there are media characters like Dawkins with his army of very aggressive followers who do shine an incredibly harsh and bright light on some fairly gloomy corners that we all agree ought to be changed but otherwise would simply go unnoticed? I agree. I, I don't think, you, you know, if, it's, if we can call it a battle, it, uh, it doesn't have to be just fought on one front and that we've somehow been sort of hammering away at the very fringes and now we can retreat and somehow be a bit more relaxed. Yeah, there, there are still examples where we, we can't afford to be compromising and we need someone like Dawkins to fight those fights if only to highlight a particular issue and to bring it into the public dialogue afterwards you know the others can come and you know, sort of do the diplomacy but I think you know you, you're not you won't be able to highlight some of these issues unless someone shouts about it unless someone like Richard Dawkins who has that voice um, can can raise it Richard himself is I interviewed him on, on the Life Scientific on Radio 4, and, and I, did, I asked him, I said, do you, do you find it annoying that you know, you're out there fighting as hard as you can, and then there are, you know, the, 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 sort of the softer atheists like me come sort of take the middle ground and say we're much more you know, diplomatic about things? He said, no, I don't mind at all. It's just sometimes it gets a bit lonely out there. You know, you should come and join me. You think, oh, that's quite sweet, really. But yes, no, I think I don't, when I, I say, you know, it's time to, to have a, a more, a, a softer approach, I don't mean that th th those like Richard Dawkins should stop doing what they're doing. It's just that that's not the way I would do things. Um, I'm a scientist and a Christian, and as you mentioned quite a lot tonight, um, you say many people question constantly. Uh, yeah. I do that as well, so every other day I question my beliefs. I just wonder whether you question your beliefs at all as an atheist, whether sometimes you think maybe there is a God, or whether you are just firmly set in your atheism. I, I, I have to give you the honest answer. When I was in my teens and early 20s, yeah, I did. I, I questioned it. You know, what if I'm wrong? Um, uh, and then I think, I must have been sometime in my 20s, I thought, when well, it's the, the, the plane crash test. If you're on a, uh, on a plane and you think it's, something's going wrong, it's really bad turbulence, and you think, oh, shit. Do you, under the duress and those moments when, you know, you, you really worry about your own mortality, do you then think, well, it can't do any harm, please God. <laughs> if you're out there, if you exist, yeah, you know, just I want to hedge my bets. And there was a point in, in, in my life when I, I stopped doing that. And so, yeah, I don't have those doubts. And, and I know, you know, you could say, well, as a scientist, you should always have doubts. You know, your theory is only as good as, uh, you know, the, 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 the latest empirical evidence to support it. And, and you could come up with a new, you design a new experiment that renders your theory 
wrong. Uh, and, and, you know, and, and what is science? Is, you know, if it's epistemology, if it's just you know, what we can know about the world, well, what, is there an ultimate truth out there that we're trying to reach back? Or can we ever be sure? All those things are, are true, but I have to give you the honest answer. I haven't, for many years, had any doubts about my atheism. And, you know, it may be that it's, uh, uh, you know, I should be more open-minded is what some of the religious people say, you know, you know, how can you be so sure and close-minded when, as a scientist, you should be questioning and, 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 and questioning your worldview? And, and you're right, you know, in a sense, you should question my worldview. I should, I should question whether quantum mechanics is the ultimate theory of the subatomic world. I should also question whether or not there's a divine creator. But, you know, as for me, in my scientific training, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm as agnostic about God as I am about Father Christmas. <laughs> uh, there was the hat, yes. And then, and then you. Uh, Professor, what do you think are the next uh, most important steps for the BHA and for humanism in general? So what are the most important battles to be fighting in the next few years? Um, well, there are a number of campaigns that are ongoing now. Um, I think one of the big things that we are starting to really get our teeth into is the issue of faith schools. Um, and and you know, that's distinct from free schools. It's distinct from collective worship in, in state schools, um, but the, the, the notion that, you know, our children are educated uh, in a particular, along a particular religious uh, world view, uh, I think is, is, should be as wrong as, as, as indoctrinating them politically. Uh, and it shouldn't be you know, free education that should be allowed. To, I mean, I've got, it has wider issues and, and it's more complicated than that. You know, what do you teach in an RE syllabus, for instance? Do you teach, do you teach humanism and atheism in RE as well? And that, that sort of thing. That's one of the big, I think, the big, uh, the big battles. Um, there, are, there are other smaller topics and campaigns that are, that are running, things like, uh, you know, euthanasia, um, which are ongoing and you're chipping away and, and you're making sure that, uh, uh, you know, government hears about them and, and some of them take a while before they get into sort of the, sort of the consciousness of politicians. Um, but yeah, there are, there are lots of issues and campaigns. I mean, the big, the big celebration you know, this year, of course, was that the humanist um, uh, marriage is, is, is going to be legalized. Um, you might think that's a a small thing, but actually, humanist weddings and funerals may end, uh, will, uh, probably are going to be the, the most important thing that the British Humanist Association does. But more broadly, we go with society's flow in terms of how it's becoming, it, it, society is becoming increasingly secular. And other campaigns will, will crop up as and when. Yes. Oh, you have to, you have to wave in a very, Um, is it, is it on? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think Einstein once said that um, science without religion is lame, and religion without science is blind. Uh, would you think? Do you think, as an atheist doing science, it's lame as a job? It's, Einstein. It was interesting because Einstein came up with all sorts of quotes like that. Einstein was great for the for the. Uh, you know, those soundbite quotes that he knew he was very quotable. Um, I'm not so sure when he, when he makes those sorts of statements how much he actually subscribes to them himself. I mean, we certainly know when Einstein says things like God does not play dice, he doesn't actually say, mean I believe in, a, in an omnipotent, you know, monotheistic entity. You know, for him, God is the laws of nature. And we know Einstein himself was a, was, was a humanist. Um, but no, I don't think, as an atheist, I just sort of, it's not surprising I say, I don't think science without religion is lame. I don't think science needs religion. Religion, however, has to be, or, or your worldview must, whether you're religious or not, must always be 
ready to be changed um, based on understanding of, of the world around us that, that, that we learn through the scientific method. But I know, for me, science isn't lame without religion. Otherwise, well, I wouldn't be an atheist. <laughs> um, is anyone from the top? Or? Okay, people here. Yes, um, lady in the middle, second to last row. And a gentleman at the, at the very back there for, for, for the next one after that. Um, enlightenment is often quite a buzzword in religious circles. What, if anything, does it mean, sort of by definition, to a humanist? Well, that's an interesting point. Enlightenment, I, when I think of enlightenment, I think of the age of enlightenment, and I associate it with, broadly, the, the birth of modern science, the, 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 the way we, you know, the scientific revolution that, that began after the Renaissance, it's not the same as what historians define as the Enlightenment, but, but to be enlightened is to be receptive to the new ideas, to be pre prepared to accept that there's something other than what was already your, your worldview that you had could be changed in the face of new evidence, that you, you become enlightened, that you learn something new. Light is shone on, on your worldview and, 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 and could change it in some way. So of people of religious faith may use en enlightened in, in a rather specific way, and I, I don't know what their definition is, but for me, enlightened, an enlightened view is, is a view that is not encumbered by dogma or uh, a, a rigid world view that, 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 is, that, that is not changed, that it has to be, you have to allow for, for new information to come in and, and, and change how you see the world. That's what it, it suggests to be enlightened. The opposite of superstitious, the opposite of uh, uh, dogmatic, outmoded ways of thinking that we know are no longer correct. And I'm not, I don't mean by that, I'm not attacking religion there. I'm, I'm, I'm saying views that, are, that go against rational thinking. Um, yeah. Thanks. Um, you said at the start that you, you treat people how you think you would like to be treated yourself. And I think we know where we've heard that before. And I'm wondering, to, to what extent are humanist is humanist morality divergent to Abrahamic morality? Because to me, it seems like you've killed God. God is dead, but you're still doing what he said. What you mean? You mean what I'm doing now, I wouldn't have done had there not your, been a your, God to tell me? Uh, your, your morality, your, your values that, that you live your life by, it's, yeah. it seems much like Christianity, just without God. Yeah. And, and are you, is humanism capable of creating new values, or does it simply just follow, follow, those values, Judeo Christian values without God. Christian values have hijacked human values. A human being. <laughs> For me, that's what defines me as a human that I have the capacity to, to love, to empathize, to sympathize, uh, to be kind. Yes, those were values that were taken up by the Abrahamic religions, and, and rightly so, because at a, back at a time when they needed, people need to be told that those are important human values. For me, I don't think we, I need to behave in a certain way because I want to seek the reward of, of God or because I fear the punishment of God. I do them because I'm a human being. So I, I, don't, I don't think they are Christian values. They are human values that Christians abide by, and therefore they are also humanist in their attitudes. They're humanists who believe in God. I, I, I don't subscribe to this idea that, you know, humanist is atheist and, and, and Christian isn't. Humanism is, a, is an attitude uh, that you know, any good person, how I define good person, uh, should behave. 
Yes, run. Hi. Um, I'm a, both a, an atheist and someone studying physics, um, and something I've heard sometimes from religious scientists uh, who I've met, um, which is an argument I, I don't subscribe to, but I'd be very interested in, in hearing what your response would be as, as an atheist, a scientist, and a humanist, is that there's sort of this, this, you know, physics is sort of so eerily beautiful and so sort of strangely convergent. You know, a favorite example I've heard is that we invent fields as a way of talking about electromagnetism, and then it turns out that the perturbations in, in those fields are particles, and then, you know, enough of them hit you in the face and you pass out. Um, that sort of eerie convergence and beauty, I think, underpins quite a lot of the motivation for religious scientists, both as scientists and as, in this particular case, as, as Christians. Do you think that that's a valid interpretation of the world? And if not, sort of, why not? I think if you have a, a, a worldview or way of interpreting the world around you through scientific discovery, if you ascribe to the beauty of nature, the workings of nature, um, some underlying spiritual divine meaning that has higher power that you can't, you know, sort of uh, define, what, nothing wrong with that. I mean, that, after all, having one, you know, wonder and amazement at the world and, 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 and how beautiful uh, the laws of nature all seem to work, and, and how you can, you know, you can describe so many disparate phenomena with a single differential equation. That that is, in a sense, a kind of re religious uh, wonderment. So I don't think I, I see no. You know, you, uh, there are many brilliant scientists who were also had deeply held religious faith, and that made them no less good scientists. It didn't mean that they, they were bad at doing experiments or they were really crap at algebra. Um, Jocelyn Bell-Burnell is talking when? In I think tomorrow. Tomorrow. Jocelyn Bell-Burnell, uh, who's an astrophysicist, uh, Oxford astrophysicist, who should have won the Nobel Prize. And uh, she was passed up on the Nobel Prize because her supervisor took it and the head of the department took it and it's one of those famous examples. She discovered pulsars, um, neutron stars, tiny uh, dense spinning stars. Um, she's a Quaker uh, and, and she's you know, very, very, you know, her, her spiritual belief is a deeply rooted belief uh, and it makes her no less a brilliant astrophysicist for it. So, you know, how she views the world and she, she can acknowledge and appreciate the wonder of the universe in the same way that an atheist scientist can. I don't think it makes one any better scientist than the other. Yes. Oh, what? Yes. Lady in the middle. You, you, you will signal to me when you think we need to be kicked out, won't you? Yes. That's fine. Good. I'll keep on going. Do you have any figures about people using the affirmation rather than a religious oath in jury service? So I did jury service many years ago, and I was the only one to affirm. But that was partly because people were intimidated about having to read a longer line to affirm rather than a religious oath. Andrew, do you have? We don't have any. I mean, it's it's some, It's been in the news recently. I think that someone was arguing to try and try and get it, make it simpler, make it more user friendly. So that, <laughs> I, I grew up in, 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 I was born in Baghdad, I grew up in Iraq, although my mother's English, and we'd come over to, to Britain for my summer holidays. When I, we finally came over in 79, I had to go to the Crown Court in my mother's hometown, Portsmouth, and swear allegiance to the Queen with my hand on a Quran. And I felt this was, so, I, so you're trusting me to a good, be a good British citizen <laughs> with two things that actually don't mean that much to me, the Queen and the Quran. <laughs> You know, if, if I put my hand on, I don't know, some sort of Leeds United match program, I'd have probably been a bit more, more <laughs> sincere. <laughs> so, yeah, I hope this is something that we'll, 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 be, you know, we'll hear more about in, in the coming months and years. Uh, yes, absolutely. Hi. Hi. Um, I just wanted to ask, I thought there was... A I felt that at certain points you were logically inconsistent because at one point you were like, I disagree with the fact that someone should impose a religion on me. 
which I completely agree with. But on the other hand, you seem to have a very glowing appreciation of Dawkins and militant atheism, which is just as much in your face kind of a thing as imposing a religion, right? Doesn't Dawkins also go ahead and talk about like how different parts of religion are nonsense and how everything to do with religion is ridiculous. So how can you be logically consistent and argue that Richard Dawkins is someone that, who must be appreciated and who stands so much for atheism? Okay, two points to make there. One is that, and the, the, the main reason I, I, I keep stressing is what, what the new atheists have done, even though I don't d agree with their methods, has allowed others, you know, has allowed that, that um, arena for discussing, for people to stand up and say, yes, we're atheists. But actually, equally importantly, we, we have to remember, when Richard Dawkins stands up and says, religion is, is wrong, it's nonsense, whatever, how is that any different to all the many millions of people of religious faith who for, for hundreds of years have said anyone who doesn't have religion is going to hell or is going to be punished. That, that's his, yeah. What? Well, no, people, I, I, I'm saying we've lived in a society where those without religion have, have been you know, assumed to be some, you know, extremists have assumed to be wrong, they're going to be um, go, going to hell, they're evil, and now we have one voice of someone say, taking the opposite view, and he's deemed an extremist. He's no more of an extremist than any preacher uh, uh, in church on a Sunday. No, I'm, I'm just saying we are in a society, in a mindset where if someone stands up and says religion is wrong, religion is bad, it's so shocking that somehow he's, he's deemed as an extremist. And yet he's just voicing an opinion, an opinion that's voiced in any religious gathering and has been for, for, for thousands of years, which is that you have to believe in God because not believing in God means you're going to go to hell. Um, I don't think it's deplorable to hold a view. I mean, de deplorable sounds like a very strong... No, it's, we're just warming up now. <laughs> no, I think I, de deplorable is such a, such a, a strong emotive word. I, if he wants to say that religion is wrong and evil, why, is, why, why are people so het up about it when atheists have had to put up for, for, you know, for as long as we can remember, being told that we're all evil, we're all going to hell, and there's, you know, it's said in a very gentle yet quite insidious way that, you know, if you don't have religion. I've been in debates with, you know, Rome Williams and, and Jonathan Sachs, you know, very intelligent theologists who nevertheless hold the view that actually without religion, you know, society will, you know, just collapse because, you know, atheists can't be good. You can't really le lead a moral life without God. That's as deplorable, if we're going to use the word deplorable, as Dawkins saying the people with religious faith are, are, are talking nonsense. So I, I think, I don't think it's deplorable. I think, you know, he's perfectly allowed to have that view. It's not an extremist view any more than anyone with religious faith hold, you know, standing up and saying, I firmly believe in God, I'm a good Christian. Of course, why can't you say that? Well, you can, should also be able to say, I'm, 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 I'm an, I, I firmly believe I'm an atheist, and be uncompromising about that. Um, there's no one, okay. There, and then. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes, I'll come to you, don't worry. So I, I didn't realize you put it in. Anyway. That's all right. Um, so your your um, your speech was was largely pertinent to a society like the UK or any Western society. Very much so. But in a place where they would behead you for blasphemy, do you think human, humanism will stand a chance? I doubt it very much. You're very you're you're right. It's a really important point. Would I, in fact, have the courage to become president of the British Humanist or the, sorry, president of the Iraqi Humanist Association? And I can say Iraqi because I'm half Iraqi, so that's fine. Um, Shelley, I'm Iraqi too. 
I mean, uh, yeah, it, it, of course, it takes a dance like more courage to, to, to stand up and voice a view where you, know, you really are in, in, not only are you in a minority, but you're in a culture where that view is just weird. You know, um, in the Islamic world, the debate about evolution versus creationism has yet to actually happen, which is incredible. Hundred, you know, 150 years or more um, after it's happening. I know there are creationists in the West, and, you know, and, and, and most thinking Christians you know, obviously are not creationists. But that's because the debate has happened. Uh, you know, those sorts of arguments and debates haven't happened, particularly in the Islamic world. And so it is much more difficult uh, to, 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 to stand up and say, I'm an atheist. I appreciate we're in a very, I'm in a very privileged position. I'm very safe that I can stand up and say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm an atheist. And technically, uh, my father is a Muslim, so technically in Islam you follow your father's religion. So I'm an apostate and, you know, I should be, you know, there should be a fatwa out. Uh, but, but, you know, I, maybe in my bubble of, you know, the, the world that I inhabit, uh, it hasn't sort of triggered uh, and anyone wanting to, you know, threaten me with, with, with death. But I certainly wouldn't, I don't know if I'd have the courage to do it if I was living in, in an Islamic country. Did you, um, yes, so, so you there, and then, and then one, two, three, four. <laughs> Good, it's all happening now. I'll try and keep my arm short. Okay. Um, I'd like to play the devil's advocate from the point of view of someone who fundamentally, profoundly agrees with you on just about everything. Um, I'm a former member of the BHA, lapsed sadly, but you know, I'm not sure there's anything I believe in anymore. I'm also a former Quaker, um, former friend of Herman Bondi. I've debated with him. He didn't want to call himself an atheist, and I said I, th I thought he probably should. Um, we had a very interesting debate about whether it's, you know, whether you should sit on the, sit on the fence, as he sort of did. But a um, number of points. Uh, Jocelyn Bell Burnell being a Quaker, well, Quakers having been one, um, they're, they're even more woolly than the, than the Church of England. You know, they say the Church of England, uh, you don't so much lose your faith as forget where you've put it. And, <laughs> um, and, the, and the Quakers are even more woolly than that. You can, you can believe anything and be a Quaker. They're lovely people. Um, uh, the, um, uh, the question about the, the creationists, I've known quite a few creationists who have long ago abandoned the idea that the Earth was created 6,000 years ago. They, they say, well, the, the days in which God created the earth were creative days, and we don't know how long they were. So that it, uh, th there needs to be a, a, um, a much clearer argument against it than just arguing against the time scale. Um, and, uh, and there was something else, but I've forgotten what it was. So, yeah. Well, I, I, my definition of creationism is that the old-fashioned 6,006 years, or 4,004 BC, or whatever it was, certainly... In the broader definition, anyone of, of, of uh, follows one of the monotheistic Abrahamic religions would say, yes, you know, we are all creationists in that in the God created the universe. And you, know, and you can interpret the, you know, the uh, Genesis as, as being some uh, descriptive way of, of explaining the creation of the universe and the Big Bang. Um, yeah, so all. I mean, in fact, the, the term Big Bang itself was... was uh, was a derogatory term invented by Fred Hoyle because he didn't think that people like George Gamow, you know, they were closet creationists to say that the universe somehow create, was created out of nothing. And so it was a, a derogatory. So, yes, so I think the broad definition of creationism, well, all, anyone with religious faith is presumably a creationist in as much as they feel they believe God created the universe. So I, I prefer to keep it to that, the, the narrower, uh, you know, man walks alongside dinosaurs type of creationism. Yes. Oh, right. Sorry. Yeah. Yes. You just direct me now because there are too many hands, and I feel I'm being unfair. Thank you for your talk, Professor. I was wondering. I really under. I understand your argument about uh, Richard Dawkins and he bringing, you know, the question out loudly. But don't you think it also has a really negative connotation? At it's prepared what should be, you know, a. Uh, feel for exchange of ideas or thoughts into it prepares more like kind of a battlefield for confrontation and not actual intellectual discussion I, well i think it's out there people have read it many people don't like richard dawkins um way of putting things across i wouldn't adopt richard dawkins style you know, of trying getting the points across. 
but I will I would read his book and think yep there's, there's, there's not much there that I would personally disagree with. So I don't think what he wrote in his book was particularly confrontational or, or you know, the, the, the extremist, you know, non-compromising atheism that people regard Dawkins as having is not something that I think came out in the pages of his book. Uh, whether the book was preaching to the converted already, as it were, is, is another matter. Richard would argue not. He would argue that his book... Uh, help convince many people who did believe in God to stop believing in God. I'm not quite sure to what extent that that is true. There must be. Uh, there, I'm sure, there are examples of that. But I don't. I don't think his the God delusion in itself was was a particularly um, extremist or, or belligerent um, way of getting atheism across. One more question. Right. Yes, you had your hand up for a while, so. Been more men than women. Yeah, that, yes, lady here with a. Um, Apologies to anyone else who hasn't. I haven't come to. Great, thank you. I have a question in regards to the the BHA's work. Uh, you said that they were looking at getting more evolution teaching into primary schools. I'm in human evolution studies. I work with that a lot, and so I've been teaching people who are coming in from high school, and even though they've had the exposure to that, it's just so much resistance to it. It's just sort of people approach it as being implicitly atheist, and they don't see a humanist perspective towards teaching something that does not include creationism in its curriculum. So how, would the, how is the BHA thinking of sort of circumventing that? Because it's a circular argument you get caught into, particularly when people have had an imbalanced educational system in that regard. I, I just find it utterly amazing. Because it would be as amazing as suddenly people saying, we are no longer teaching that the earth goes round the sun or that the earth is round. It is flat and, and you know, we have to have a balanced view. The, earth, the fact that the earth is round or the, or the heliocentric model of the solar system is just a theory. It's not truth and there are other ways of truth. You know, evolution for me is so self-evident. It's, it's not you know, it could be right, it could be wrong. And I thought that battle had been won over a century ago. The fact that people are now trying to resurrect an argument that's completely outdated, completely unsupportable by so much evidence is worrying. I, I, I'm, I, I'm very Dawkin-esque on that, on, on, on that um, front. That, you know, somehow that evolution should be alongside creationism, both taught together, because that's the f a fair way of doing things, I think is absolute nonsense. Creationism is just no, no room for it in the 21st century. Thank you very much, Professor Al-Khalili, and thank you, all of you, for turning up. Um, just one quick announcement for what's going on later on this week. On Wednesday at 2 o'clock, we have the executive editor of the New York Times, the fifth most powerful woman in the world, coming to speak. On Thursday, we have... On Thursday, you're not a woman, it's okay. okay. On Thursday, we have the classic debate. This house has no confidence in Her Majesty's government. On Friday evening, we have the last king of Bulgaria coming and speaking. And of course, on Saturday, as I'm sure you all know, we have the Freshers' Ball tickets tomorrow. And so, lastly, thank you very much, Professor Al-Khalili. It's been a most thought-provoking talk, and I hope you've enjoyed your stay. I have Wonderful. indeed. Thank you very much.